I first met him in the early 80s in a Chinatown of urban Java. He didn't want his real name or address revealed, so we called him DJ for Dynamo Jack. He was only a healer, he said, but he did direct a powerful energy generated from his own body into his patients. Sometimes he used the needles, sometimes just his hands. He called the energy Qi, and it was so strong that he usually needed a grounder to hold his patient's feet. For years, we followed him around Java on his healing rounds, pleading to be allowed to film him. But he always refused, saying his powers resulted from a type of meditation with an ancient tradition of secrecy. It was only when my brother Lorn was suffering from a serious eye infection that he finally allowed us to film him in 1987. It was nothing like any acupuncture I'd ever had. I was getting really powerful electric shocks and couldn't control my movements at all. Im yang, positive and negative, you know? Mm -hmm. And my positive from here and my negative from here. Mm -hmm. And we meet together, this can get uh, like electricity. And is this because you're special, you have a special sort of uh, no, it's body? It's meditation every day. It's meditation that does it? It's meditation every day. Like you can touch me, I like this. Mean, yeah. It's nothing, okay? Mm. It's my burn. Uh, it's like this. <laughs> For our sound recorders, it was also a shocker. He then took our newspaper outside and showed us how qi can also be used to set things on fire. When he heard we'd shown this footage in public, he was very upset and refused all our future efforts to contact him again. As the years passed, we sadly resigned ourselves to never seeing him again. My brother Lorne never did, for by 1997 he was already dead, when I again found myself with DJ, now treating me for an eye problem. But it wasn't this that brought me back. He had tracked me down, out of the blue, and invited me to tell me a story. He had just returned from two years on a deep meditational journey, alone in the heart of Borneo. Amongst his revelations, he had seen, he said, how history was moving on into great change, and the old wisdom was vanishing. So he'd called me back to film just enough of him to remind us that we all have undreamed of powers sleeping within us, and that there's nothing special about him except for his training in waking room. Yeah. Grounding this patient, my cameraman Joe is having to use all his weight to keep contact. But she is pushing him away. <laughs> he seems able to control the amplitude of this chi, like a dimmer switch and it causes uncontrollable responses in the patients and their grounders. I can barely keep my hand on you. Why are oh, the electricity so strong? This mother unwittingly grounds her child. He won't sit still, so she's asked to hold him and grin and bear it. Sometimes, signs of this passing energy can be seen in the transmitter, too. This chi stuff is only the surface, he says, of the real adventure beneath in the meditational technique. Projecting chi from the palm of the hand can also be used to resist rifle pellets, he says. First, you learn to distinguish between yin and yang chi in your body. Then, how to pull it in your navel chakra. Then, how to project it, he says. 
and it's the proportionate mixture between yin and yang which accounts for different effects, like pulling or pushing objects or igniting them. Then he gets really strange. He says that mastering yin qi is the key to the spirit world. There's a long tradition of Indonesian chrises being possessed by spirits. So people bring him their chrises to see if they're dads. Here, he says, he doesn't manipulate matter by projecting mixtures of yin and yang qi. He merely creates a field of yin energy in which, he says, if there's a spirit, it can manifest itself. So I invited a small group of scientists back from the United States with measuring equipment to test if DJ was for real. And if so, where might this energy belong on the electromagnetic spectrum? Catherine Cook, CEO of the Mind Science Foundation in Texas. Dr. Roger Nilsson, a Swedish medic and international racing sailor. Dr. Greg Simpson, a physicist from New York's Albert Einstein University. And Andreas Polak, one of DJ's Australian students. The visitors are confident they'll uncover him as a fraud in no time. Greg is the first guinea pig, and he's uncomfortable about showing that he can feel anything at all. Dr. Roger doesn't know what to expect. <laughs> Out comes the metal detector, like the things they use in airports, to see if he has any concealed metal in his body. Then the voltmeter to try and measure the chi. But how to get it to work? Where's the ground? What settings? DJ suggests that as his negative is his perineum and his positive is his navel chakra, perhaps that's where the electrode should be attached. He doesn't stand on his dignity. He's eager to help, but still no readings. They're getting shocks off his arm, and now they're on the right settings, but the needle still isn't moving. DJ says it isn't electricity, it's chi. It's one, two, oh, I feel it in my whole body. I feel it, it's three, oh, point three, I feel it in my legs, shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but suspecting there's some tricky setup on his premises they can't find, they insist we all go to a randomly chosen hotel room several miles away to see if he can light a light bulb with his fingers. It doesn't ground on the wall. So Greg holds and grounds one wire, while DJ pumps Chi through the other. The bulbs are LEDs, light-emitting diodes, which ignite in different colors according to the intensity of current. Yes. On, off, on. Brilliant. Oh, you're blinking. Things were going well. DJ was enjoying it too, until he invited us all out to lunch at his local, where he tried to push a chopstick through the table. He couldn't get it through the formica surface, so he came up through an inch of wood from underneath. Not only did he draw his own blood, but a chopstick splinter had caught Allison here between the eyes, drawing more. The incident was laughed off apologetically, but next morning he was a different man, drawn and upset. He said he'd been visited all night by his long-dead master, raging that he'd broken the strict taboos of his sect, never to show off in public and never to cause harm or draw blood. He felt deeply chastised. All further testing and filming must end. Never again would he submit to public scrutiny, nor accept any new students. He would sink from sight and continue his healing in obscurity, as he had done since before we met him in the early 80s and had always told us was right.